the people of ancient Britain were called the Cymry and were not Celtic. Neither are the Irish Celtic, but correctly Gaels. The Cymric British occupied all of Britain. When the Angles and Saxons began arriving in Britain in AD 389, and then in large numbers around AD 500, they misnamed the Cymry as Welsh. Valisha is an old High German word that means strangers. The incoming Angles and Saxons called the Cymric strangers in their own land. The Celts were people who lived in southern Gaul between the rivers Sequana and Garumna, now called the Seine and the Garonne. There is no evidence of blood ties, shared culture or shared religion between these people and the Cymric British. Therefore, it is logical to say the religion of the British had nothing to do with the Celts, who dwelt in southern France. There are a number of Roman and Greek writers who described the Druid religion of the Celts, but only one had even minimal knowledge of Britain. The Roman and Greek writers who described the Celts of Gaul are Strabo, Julius Caesar, Diodorus Siculus, Cicero, Pliny the Elder, Pomponius Mela, Suetonius Tranquillus, Diogenes Laertius, and Ammianus Marcellinus and they knew nothing of the British religion. Ancinius Pollio, a contemporary of Caesar, is recorded as saying, Caesar's works were composed with little accuracy and little truth. Cornelius Tacitus did write about Britain, but relied on vague soldiers' tales of his father-in-law, Agricola, who was the Roman governor of those south-eastern parts of Britain seized by Rome. Tacitus is not a pillar of honesty and integrity, and the lack of honesty in his writings is frequently commented upon. There are no records of the ancient British Druidic religion from classical sources. The only sources that are detailed and reliable are native British sources. The ancient British Druidic religion was in fact comprehensively recorded and re-recorded down the centuries and we still have the ancient preserved law of our ancestors today. In the early days of book writing, each generation of bard wrote his book, which was a copy of older bard books, and would have included with it his own notes and continuations. This process of reproduction rolled on and on down the centuries, and so we have the copies of copies of copies, many quite old, which preserve for us our British ancestral philosophy and religion. This had begun to be published in 1784 and perhaps earlier, probably to the alarm of the British establishment. The philosophical triads, the moral triads, the religious triads, and the historical triads are still all available to us. The laws of King Diffenwall Mulmud Donald Bald of around 420 BC are available, 
as are the laws of around AD 920, compiled by Prince Blake Weirwood. A comprehensive volume titled Bardas and subtitled The Bardo Druidic System was published in 1858, containing the collected works of a number of notable bards, which included with it a full account of the bardic system of belief and shows the wood language alphabet used by the Druids. Reliable accounts of bardic philosophy and law are plentiful. Writing, letters and their symbolic meanings are so inextricably entwined with the Druidic system that even their creation myth is a symbolic representation of how writing and letters came into existence. According to the Druidic mythology, when God spoke his name, all light and life came into being. And Menu saw the light in the form of three columns, and heard a voice emanating from the light. And he perceived that the light and sound were one thing united together. And he understood that all sound, life and light were all one unitedly with God. And even the least thing in existence is God. He now understood how to represent speech in symbolic form. And because earth had appeared beneath him, he drew a symbol for the voice and the light on the earth. Three columns of the symbol were later each assigned a letter, originally O, I, O, and then many other variations. Along with these symbols came the knowledge of the language of the Cymru, the Kimraig, and every other language. Menu is described in the myth as being the aged son of Menwid. Both of these names have a root which suggests they represent mind. Many are familiar with the broad arrow symbol. The Cymru call it the Awen. The letters of the Cymru alphabet are made up of the three strokes of the hour in different combinations. The alphabet was designed to be cut into wooden sticks or rods using knives or small axes. This form of writing on wood is known as colbrin. Bren translates as wood. Colbrin translates as wood of credibility. In the bardic system, it is believed that the first letters were carved in wood. Before Christianity, letters were called gogarums and were also called curvin by some. There are several words in Kimraig which relate to knowledge that reference wood. Arwid, a sign. Kifarwid, skillful. Kifarwidid, information. Kiwid, revelation. Deadwid, having recorded knowledge or happy. Derwid, a druid. Equidor, a rudiment, an alphabet. Gwiddor, a rudiment. Gwidon, a man of science. Gwynwidigion, men of sacred knowledge. The ancient method of cutting letters on wood is often alluded to in the poems of the bards. Thus, the wooden axe of an unpolished bard has been hewing a song to Gwen Lian. From composing three complete treatises of wood language, 
of wood letters. If he would have an encomium of gentle character, let him go into the wood to cut a memorial. Here is a brief explanation of how Colbrun was made. Use green wood, take a branch from an oak tree and split it into four parts, each the length of a forearm, hewn square into four sides of equal width, a third of an inch. The bard could then write on each of the four or sometimes three sides and multiple rods could be attached to a frame. Each could then be turned on the frame and read. Bards would write in a poetic form known as a roll, which was used between the 6th and 17th centuries. This form of poetry was brought to Britain from Rome by Bran the Blessed, who also brought the knowledge of making vellum paper. The bards record that the first man to make paper was named Moran from Constantinople. He ground flax, which when thinly spread out became paper. In the Cymric mythology, the original ten letters were created by Einigan the Giant. The Cymri had ten letters before they came to the Isle of Britain. Before the time of Beli the Great, son of Manigan, who was the father of the Caswallan, mentioned in my previous video, the myth of Roman Britain, there were ten letters. These could be pronounced as a word, Absedoros. Later, M and N were added to make Mabsednilros. Later still, other letters appeared. Many letters emerged from a convention of using the original letters to make other sounds. M was two B's put together. P was a B turned upside down, for example. Some records say there were 13 letters in the beginning and that they could be reversed to make 26. Later alphabets used the original name Absedoros for the Colbrin alphabet. By the time of Taliuersin, the chief of the bards, around 500 AD, there were 20 primary letters. The letters never ranged beyond 20 primaries. However, Geraint, the blue bard, did appoint 24 letters, but the four extra letters were considered auxiliaries. Other letters were added up to 38, but only the 24 were used in writing. In the early times of the nation, Kimri letters were called cuttings. It was not until after the time of Beli, son of Manigan, that they were called letters. It appears that before the time of Beli the Great, the knowledge of the science of letters was kept secret from the general public. When Christianity came to the Kimri, there were 18 letters. This arrangement continued for a long time, up to the time of King Henry V, who forbade schools, books and writing materials for the Kimri. So, in response, the Kimri organised themselves so that they sent bards into every household that wanted to learn letters and reading. Bards were paid in land rights, tilth and fold, and so the bards became more numerous and the knowledge of letters was greater than before the prohibition. In the time of Owain, son of Maxon Ludig, the nation of Kimri recovered much of its lost heritage. They returned to their mother tongue rather than the Latin, which had almost overrun the Isle of Britain. Kimraig was used to record the history and laws. By this time, the knowledge of some of the correct spellings for the ten original letters had been lost, especially how to depict double letters. Amendments were made by Talhayan 
of Kalyon upon Uruk, under the protection of the Round Table. After him, Taliwurzin, chief of the bards, arranged the Kimrig and recovered the proper meanings and spellings of the ten letters. Taliwurzin used eighteen letters in his canons. After Owen Glindir died, paper and dress skins were outlawed, so cuttings on wood came back into use. Colburn continued until Latin was forgotten in the country, only known by students and scholars. There were three degrees of bard, originally of equal rank, but each having different responsibilities, each level associated with a colour. Ovates who wore green were responsible for keeping the knowledge of symbols. Bards who wore blue were responsible for upholding the memorial of national voice and vocal song. Druids who wore white were responsible for teaching the nation science and wisdom. The system of Druids, Bards and Ovates was established in the time of Diffenwar Molmud, the great lawmaker, probably around 470 BC. These ancient sages knew that life began in the oceans in the most primitive forms and gradually developed in ascending fashion down the millennia before evolving into advanced mammals and finally man. In this they anticipated Darwin by several millennia. They held that neither time nor space were absolutes thinking that parallels the theory of relativity. The Greeks derived their similar alphabet after being taught by a British juridic instructor named Aberis. Druidism also supported and encouraged the advancement of knowledge and science, which they believed would enhance the development of the soul. The Druids believed that there were three circles of existence, which were the circle of Abred, in which exist all corporal and dead existences, the circle of Gwynfeid, in which all are animated and immortal beings, the circle of Kagant, where there is only God. All beings emerge from Anun, the other world, or the great deep of outer space, which was a form of limbo where the least possible form of existences survived in a form of coma. From Anun, all life existences entered the circle of Abred and progressed steadily upwards from the lowest forms of life to the highest form which was man. Each being or soul had to endure all the known forms of life successively. So, starting off as an amoeba, the entity moved steadily upwards and progressed through all the various insect, fish, bird and animal forms. In each life or existence, the soul gained more experience, which allowed it to move up the ladder. This doctrine of the transmigration of the soul through successively higher life forms in this circle of Abred was firmly held and it was also believed that all life first crawled out of the sea in the simplest life forms. Much of this was published by a theologian in 1846 and must have been known to Charles Darwin who studied theology. At the stage of being human, the soul now has the responsibility to live a moral life. The penalty for doing evil and wrongdoing is severe, for the wrongdoer would be demoted on the ladder of ascending life forms. This demotion would depend on the seriousness of the crime, so a mass murderer would certainly find himself off as an amoeba 
whilst lesser offenders would find themselves as pigs or cats or whatever. There was, however, a way out of the system of restarts at lower life forms. If a man had committed a capital crime, stopped running, came forward and surrendered himself, then he was rewarded. The Druids, as the administrators of the law, would duly execute the confessed criminal, but he was guaranteed to return to his next life as a human being. This avoidance of the centuries of toil moving up the ladder of life was apparently a valued form of pardon. This voluntary submission for punishment for a crime was known as Aenid Fowder. The laws of Diffenwal Molmud specify that the penalty was beheading or hanging or being burned alive, the choice being made by the king or the lord of the territory. The idea appears to have been that Aenid Fowder appeased God and so the reincarnated soul was not placed in so lowly a position as might otherwise have been. A murderer who escaped punishment and died a natural death would return in a transmigratory life at a very low level in the order of life. His soul would descend into an animal corresponding to his disposition at the end of his life. Since the divine being wishes every human to be saved, then whatever is done to promote that objective and to bring it about speedily must be pleasing to God. Some human souls would need to experience several human lives before they finally graduated to their ultimate goal as an angelic soul in the circle of Gwynfaid. The belief was therefore one involving reincarnation and the transmigration of the soul. Every soul finally gets to the desired level of the circle of Gwynfaid. The good soul finally entered the heavenly bliss of the circle of Gwynfaid, whilst the soul of the evil man was recycled back through existences in the Abred. Humanity is a state of liberty where the human can attach itself to either good or evil by choice. The circle of Kagant was the dwelling place of God, and no soul could aspire to enter this hallowed circle of Kagant, where only God himself lived. In British Druidism and Bardism, there was only one God. The notion that there were multiple gods in the British religious scheme may have originated by the indefensible supposition that the British and Celtic Druid faiths were the same. It may also have arisen the Roman habit of explaining the nature of other religions in the same pattern as their own pantheon of familial gods. The dwelling place of God was in the sun, and this might have caused the confusion in some minds that the British Druids were sun worshippers. The sun was not seen as God, but simply the home of God. Any connection to Stonehenge is also invalid as Stonehenge existed in Britain for long ages before the Cymru arrived. The adoption of basic Christianity into the British Druidic faith would appear to stem from the massive impression that might have been made on at least some Druid minds by the idea that Jesus the Nazarene voluntarily submitted himself to the fate of sacrificial Aenid Fowder whilst being an innocent man who had committed no crime. There was no hell as such in the British Druidic religion. There was merely a place of near non-existence where the soul lingered on as in a coma, unable to advance and develop towards the angelic state of the circle of Gwynfaid. One of the great compilers of information on Colburn and the Bardic Druidic system was a man called Yolo Morganuk. The information he was revealing went against the politically correct history favoured by the establishment, so he was accused of being a forger. Ancient writers that alluded to the existence of Colburn have been published many times in the modern age, 
and the discovery of stones that are hundreds of years old displaying Colburn's script has demolished the notion that everything was forged by Yellow Morganog. The fact that the assertion of forgery is allowed shows the level of corruption in academia. <laughs>